Okay, I'd like to welcome all of you to the 2013 Dewey Lecture in Law and Philosophy. Uh, we're delighted to uh, welcome Philip Pettit from Princeton, uh, my alma mater, so it's wonderful to have you here, and, uh, and also from the Australian National University. And Martha Nussbaum will introduce Philip in, in just a moment. But first I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Dewey Lecture. Uh, the, for those of you who are, are new to, the, to, to our community for this lecture at this time, uh, the, the lecture series was founded almost 30 years ago in honor of John Dewey. Dewey's connection, as all of you know, to the University of Chicago was strong and deep. From the university's inception in 1894 until 1904, Dewey was the chair of the University of Chicago's philosophy department. During that time, he founded what came to be called the Chicago School of Pragmatism, an intellectual movement that applied scientific methods to societal problems. In addition, Dewey created the university's laboratory school in 1896. In 1981, former dean of the law school, Gerhard Casper, decided that the law school should recognize Dewey and recognize the tie of Dewey to the university and his contributions to legal theory. He corresponded with philosopher Sidney Hook, then president of the John Dewey Foundation, and established a lectureship in Dewey's name at the law school. Hook readily agreed to fund this lectureship, and from then on, we've had a series of distinguished uh, lecturers, uh, culminating today with Philip Pettit. Among the philosophers who gave Dewey lecturers in the past are Amartya Sen, Ronald Dworkin, Amy Gutman, Richard Rorty, and our own Martha Nussbaum. In addition, John Rawls' famous paper, The Idea of Public Reason Revisited, was a Dewey lecture that was then converted and published into our law review. Now, our school was founded on the idea that lawyers need to know more than just the black letter law. This is something that we're finding, uh, in fact, I was just having a conversation with Martha about this five minutes ago, uh, when we, we started a little bit late. Uh, the, this is something that is more current today than at any time in our past uh, as a law school, this commitment, and, and it's being called into question by some people in newspapers and journals and blogs and the like. So we're steadfastly committed to the idea that we want to teach our students, we want to do research on more than just black letter law. We also want to understand the theoretical underpinnings of the very idea of laws and lawmaking. Now, in the documents, and this goes deep in our law school, in the documents that helped advise President Harper on the founding of our school, it was recommended that the students be introduced, quote, to the elements of law, the science which reduces legal phenomena to order and coherence. Ernst Freund, one of the founding faculty members of the law school and the champion of interdisciplinary legal education, even wanted to call the law school a school of jurisprudence rather than a school of law. And it's perhaps no coincidence that Martha Nussbaum holds the Ernst Freund Chair in Law and Ethics. So as all of you can see, it's really quite fitting and appropriate that Philip Pettit joins us today as the Dewey Lecturer. Now, it's also particularly appropriate and right that the person to introduce Philip Pettit is Martha Nussbaum. Martha is among the intellectual giants in law and philosophy, along with our Brian Leiter, Martha makes our school among the most prominent, prominent legal institutions in the country to focus on law and philosophy. She's the author of at least 17 books. I have to revise this every year to go more and more, and has edited at least 15. Uh, her most recent book, which I really am not sure it's the most recent book, because uh, I haven't been over to look at the table at the seminary co-op recently, uh, or at least in the past week, uh, is called The New Religious Intolerance, Overcoming the Politics of Fear in an Anxious Age. Now, after the lecture, so I'm not going to be coming back up. I want to invite all of you to join us for a reception outside. 
And now what I'd like to do is introduce Martha, bring Martha Nussbaum up here to introduce our speaker. Well, welcome. It's a real pleasure to welcome Philip Pettit to give the Dewey Lecture. I think he's one of the ideal people to deliver this lecture, not only because of the wide range and interdisciplinarity of his work, but because he um, has pursued for many years a distinctive and very powerful theory, which he's uh, articulated with rigor but an ever-deepening articulation, and at the same time, with attention to how it might be implemented in real life, uh, of which more in a, in a bit. Uh, but first, some, some formalities. Pettit is the Lawrence Rockefeller University Professor of Politics and Human Values at Princeton University. He's also Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the Australian National University, where he, in fact, taught for many years before moving to Princeton. He's Irish by birth and education, and he's also taught in England. He's a fellow of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, of the Royal Irish Academy, and the Australian Academies of Humanities and Social Sciences. He has many honorary degrees, including from the National University of Ireland, Queen's University Belfast, and the University of Montreal. Pettit's written very widely on a range of philosophical issues, but he's best known for his work in Republican political theory in books such as The Common Mind, 1996, Republicanism, A Theory of Freedom and Government, 1997, A Theory of Freedom, 2001, and then the very recent On the People's Terms, A Republican Theory and Model of Democracy, 2012. He also has two more books in press based on series of lectures. A book about him, Common Minds, Themes from the Philosophy of Philip Pettit, was published in 2007. Pettit's work has several characteristics that impress me a great deal, six, in fact, that I'll mention. And they're rarely found together, and, and so I think in having all six, he's actually pretty unique. One is theoretical depth and rigor. Throughout the years, he's pursued the Republican view, and it, does, it always seems to get richer and better with each articulation. Second is clarity of expression which doesn't always go with theoretical depth in philosophy. The new book, I think, is especially distinguished in that regard. It even has a very clear summary of the whole argument at the end. So that, that's, uh, I think, enormously uh, helpful for, for people who are trying to have access to the theory. The third, which I particularly uh, um, value, is historical depth. Unlike some other moral and political philosophers, Pettit spends a lot of time on the history of these problems in great thinkers of the past. And he does this really well and in a way that clearly enriches his own work. The views of his historical pre predecessors in Republican theory, from the ancient Romans to Rousseau and beyond, but also some who are not in his direct line. So he has a whole book on Hobbes that appeared in 2008. The fourth is breadth within philosophy. Pettit has worked uh, not just in moral and political philosophy, but also in metaphysics and philosophy of mind, including free will. And this, and he's, he said uh, quite a bit about this, gives depth and substance to his political thought. The fifth is disciplinary breadth. Pettit brings to bear on his political theory not just work in philosophy, but also uh, other work in political science, sociology, and economics. And then there's one final thing that I think is, is really fun to talk about, and that is practical commitment and experience. Pettit uh, actually has many, uh, some traits in common with the ancient Greek and Roman theorists who influenced his view. But one uh, big one that may come as a surprise is that like uh, Plato, Seneca, and some others we know only by report, he's actually been the philosophical advisor to a prince, namely to Prime Minister Zapatero of Spain, who saw in Pettit's theory of non-domination an appealing way of articulating his own political ideals with great unity and force for the Spanish public. There's a fascinating and I think quite powerful book, A Political Philosophy in Public Life, Republicanism in Zapatero, Spain, which Pettit co-authored with Jose Luis Martí in 2010, and that, that describes that collaboration. The authors tell the story of Pettit's work with Zapatero and its practical consequences, but then also, in a very 
wonderful chapter by Pettit, they give an account of what a philosophical theory needs to be like if it is to be implemented in real life. And I think it's, a, it's a actually a very courageous and heartening book. Now, Pettit had a considerable advantage over Plato and Seneca because Zapatero was much more receptive to good philosophical thinking than Dionysius of Syracuse and certainly than the young Nero. But on the other hand, he had a disadvantage in that, uh, well, according to his own theory, it should have been this way, but still, it was a disadvantage from some points of view. He was operating in a democracy. And so uh, changing times changed Spanish politics. And in 2011, Zapatero announced he wouldn't seek re-election after seven years in power. And the current lot don't really have the same values. So, so we, we hope that the non-domination view lasts in some deeper sense. And it certainly has had lasting influence, for example, in the legalization of same-sex marriage and there's no sign that that's going to be reneged on, and measures against gender discrimination. So there, there's now just a seventh characteristic, which is that, as you'll soon see, Pettit is a, a person of great verve and élan and, and a very delightful speaker. And, and so I welcome him to give his lecture on giving corporate agents their due and not more than their due. Thanks for that. It's a, it's a wonderful honor to be here and to be one of the, um, uh, to come in this long line of very distinguished Dewey lecturers. It's, uh, it's a real challenge actually having heard <laughs> exactly who has given it prior to uh, try to live up to the expectations when fears may be held up one. <laughs> but uh, I'd also like to thank very much Martha for that uh, extraordinarily generous and utterly overstated introduction. But uh, to work. So I've called this paper Giving Corporate Agents Their Due and Only Their Due. Forgive my Irish pronunciation of that word, come to think of it. Um, it's focused on the issue of corporate rights. And this is a particular challenge, in a way, for me. And just by way of explaining why I'm interested in the topic. Because with Christian List uh, from the London School of Economics, I published a book two years ago uh, called uh, Group Agents, Group Agency. And uh, in that book, we defend a strong theory of group agents as agents who are distinct, I'll come to that in the one part of the lecture, from the actual members, the individual agents who make them up. And of course, a challenge to such a view is, and we argued, I should say, as part of that view, and I had argued independently, that corporate bodies, corporate agents of this kind, of this distinct kind as I think of them, that they should be, they're fit to be held responsible. Uh, my focus is on moral responsibility, but obviously that connects with issues of legal liability, though there are many, there are many questions that arise between, uh, um, that between the uh, moral responsibility and legal responsibility, which I haven't addressed. However, in arguing that they are fit to be held responsible, the question arises, but are they also fit to be given all the rights of individual human beings if they're fit to be held responsible as individual human beings are. And uh, we did address that challenge in some way in the book. In fact, uh, I think it's part of the, very much of the theory that uh, a certain theory of rights as well as responsibilities for group agents. However, I think both Christian and I feel that we could have given more attention to the rights theme. And of course, it's become particularly salient in view of uh, various developments in American jurisprudence over the last few years, not, not least the Citizens United judgment of um, uh, two or three years ago. Anyhow, you know, that's by way of background. So the question, I hope you all have a handout which I made available. Uh, I, um, I used to use PowerPoint. Yeah, I sort of feel I should say I'm not completely a throwback. But I've decided that handouts, well, at least you can take them away afterwards <laughs> if there's something to, uh, uh, to be worth, to, to be worth uh, worth holding on to. So the question that I'm addressing, as I say at the beginning here, is the question of what rights should be assigned under legal and social practices to group agents? 
Uh, now, I should say group agents here, I understand very broadly for the moment. It'll get a bit clearer exactly what I have in mind. So it will certainly include universities and churches and associations of various kinds, as well, of course, as uh, commercial corporations. Um, the question is, what rights under a law and under the norms of society in general should they be assigned? Now, this is a moral question in the sense of we're asking about what fundamentally ought to be the case. And we're asking fundamentally what rights in law and in social practices ought to be given to these entities. So I stress that because it's not a, there's no suggestion, I'm not asking about whether corporate entities have moral rights. I'm asking about whether morally they ought to have legal or social rights. Uh, this is important because in answering the question as to what rights in law corporate entities should have, of course, one then goes to uh, a philosophical theory uh, which determines what rights they ought to have. This may be a theory that takes you to the goods associated or relevant to determining what rights they ought to have, but equally it might go to some theory of basic natural or moral rights in that sense. Uh, but that's a further issue. I'm concerned basically with rights in the institutional sense rather than the moral sense. And, uh, and the answer I'm going to give is a yes and a no. I'm going to say that yes, interestingly, and this will be pretty well the first half of the presentation, I think, yes, corporate agents uh, are served and should be served by institutional rights playing the same role, more or less, as they play for individual uh, human agents. Uh, that's the yes part. The no part is that no, when it comes to the question of what actual rights should they be given, given that rights are required to play a role, the same role as for individual rights, uh, for individual agents, exactly what rights should they be given? And that breaks into two questions. One is, on what basis should we determine the rights that these corporate agents should be given? And secondly, what range of rights ought they to, to be given? And I'm going to say no, they shouldn't be given rights on the same basis as individual human beings, even though the rights will serve the same role. Uh, and equally, um, they ought not to be given the same range of rights as individual human beings are given. By way of background, very briefly, so that the talk's going to divide into three sections, one on the issue of uh, the claim that they deserve to be given rights in the same role, and then the two other sections on, but not on the same basis and not in the same range as individual human beings. But before coming to that, just a few words by way of background, and in a way this is more or less familiar sort of line. It's broadly uh, related to the work that all of us know from Hofeld and to a certain extent from Hart. I just want to say a little on how it is that practices can establish rights, legal practices, social practices, since, as I said, that's my focus as to what rights in those practices a corporate agents ought to be given. Um, practices always involve rules, let us say. The rules may be laws, formal laws, or they may be informal social norms. And just by way of background, this is common, um, common to a lot of traditions, and I hope it's not too basic to even mention, but still let's get clear about it. Rules associated with a practice like that, uh, they, they're going to forbid certain actions. Uh, they're going to forbid the actions that are inconsistent with those rules uh, being in place. Um, they're equally going to require other actions. They're going to require those actions, the not doing of which, the omission of which, uh, they forbid. And of course, they're going to permit a third category of actions. I mean, apart, they obviously permit actions they require, but in the sense of permit where it means only permit, they'll permit a third category of actions. So any set of rules are going to, uh, for practice coordinating individuals, are going to rule out some actions, forbid them, require others, those whose omissions they rule out, and permit a third category of actions. And with those very simple, well, I should also say that rules of that kind uh, may not just be primary rules, as Herbert Hart calls them, but also include secondary rules about how the rules themselves should be altered. And whenever you've got a set of rules like that, you're going to have, it seems to me, a whole range of rights which um, supervene on those rules. They have their place in virtue of those rules being, um, being in existence. So you get, well, I, these are not exactly Hofeld's terms, but uh, they're terms that I hope are communicative. I think you get 
rules will give people a privilege right to do various things, the things that they don't forbid. And uh, in particular, they give them privilege rights when they also require others not to prevent people exercising those privilege rights. So the two sides to rules establishing privilege rights for certain agents, they must not forbid the exercise of those rights, of course, and they must oblige others not to prevent uh, agents exercising those rights. Claim rights, again, that is, of course, Hofeld's term. Claim rights uh, arise when the rules require others to provide people with a certain treatment or a certain license to act in a certain way. Uh, those are claims, then, that those individuals have against others. With the privileged rights, they only have a claim against others not to be prevented. With a claim right, they have a claim against others to a more positive sort of treatment or even assistance in performing certain rights. There are also authority rights, of course, and those are the rights that those agents designated as agents authorized to change the rules. The authority right will be the right of such agents, maybe all of us as a community in a given community of rules, uh, or maybe some of us who are set aside or designated, they will have rights to alter the rules in various ways. And then, of course, some people will have, all of us will have in some area under a set of rules or may have immunity rights, meaning those are cases where the authorities established with the capacity to change rights are forbidden, however, to change these particular rights, these immunities. And finally, of course, there are remedial rights, like under any system of rights. Uh, people are going to, individuals are going to have a claim right against the authority to protecting them against others and, of course, perhaps, and to vindicating them perhaps also. Uh, I'm sorry for taking time over this, but just to get absolutely clear, that's the background I have in mind. So you have a set of rules, they get established in a community. We might be talking about the rules of a small community or the rules of a whole society. The rules may be social and informal, or there may be proper laws. And whenever you get rules like that governing human action, you're going to get certain things forbidden, certain things allowed, certain things required. And again, you're going to have people having rights under those rules, and the rights are going to assume these very various forms. So now, with that by way of background, let me turn to the first question as to whether rights can serve in the same role for uh, corporate agents as they do for individual agents. Well, just to think about individual agents, first of all, the purpose served by rules, any rules of the kind I've been thinking of, is obviously to coordinate individuals uh, relations to one another, because any such rules will signal, for example, possibilities of action that are open to these people, consistently with the rules, in relating to one another. They're also going to safeguard those possibilities of interaction that they signal as possible, available, allowable, uh, safeguard them by protecting people in the exercise of those activities, uh, perhaps even safeguard them by perhaps uh, by preventing um, various, let me not go down that track, come to think of it. it it'll come up later, but it'll, it'll be too, too complex now to, to introduce. And they finally, they also, of course, they may serve to actually support people in the exercise of those activities. If, for example, the activities require certain resources, the rules in place may uh, give people a claim right against the community if they need a certain assistance or resources to be given the resources to exercise those rights. These are all possible functions, obviously, that rules play amongst a community, coordinating the relations and the interactions of individuals with one another. But now, I want to ask you to think about why is it that, or how is it that rules can actually play that role for individual human agents? Because notice, it's very striking. Um, animal communities uh, do not have rules of that kind. Uh, they could play no ro role that we can see in an animal community, in a, a community of non-human animals. Um, and so the question is, what is it about human beings that means that rules can play this important role? And obviously, it seems to me, it has to be the case that individual human beings understand the rules. Um, it has to be the case that they subscribe to the rules at perhaps a level of reluctance, but and still subscribe to themselves in the sense of accepting that they're ex expected to conform to the rules. And it has to be the case that having understood the rules, subscribed to the rules, they're capable of 
regulating their own behavior so as to conform to the rules. And this indeed has to be a matter of common awareness. It has to be more or less obvious to everyone that actually everyone does understand the rules around here. Everybody does, in some sense, subscribe to them. And everybody is more or less able to actually live up to the rules to which they subscribe. Now, human individuals clearly do make individual agents do meet these conditions with all ranges of rules. We uh, satisfy those sorts of conditions. Animal agents do not. The question is, what about corporate agents? Are they capable of meeting those sorts of conditions, of being able to understand, subscribe to, and actually conform uh, to rules? Well, just moving back a little bit, let me uh, spend a, a few minutes thinking about um, what it is about individual human beings that makes the big difference with animals and that enables them to coordinate in this way, that enables them to understand rules, to subscribe to rules, and to indeed conform their behavior to rules. And let me introduce just one word in order to sum up what I think is the capacity that enables human beings to do that. And the word I like, it's a word I like, the word, it's an old English word, is the word conversable. Um, I, I use that to sum up a number of capacities that we clearly have as individual agents. Um, conversability at the first level is the capacity not just to have certain beliefs, not just to have certain preferences, not just even to value certain things. Um, certainly other animals, it seems to me, can have beliefs, they can have desires, they can have preferences, they can have all of that. The dog clearly has a belief that the family are coming home and it hears the gate opening when it lifts its ears, runs to the gate, you know, uh, that's clearly displaying, it seems to me, intentional behavior. But we have more than just the capacity to form beliefs and other attitudes of that kind. We also have the capacity to use sentences, I'd say propositions, uh, to identify what it is that we believe. So not only do we believe for an arbitrary, as philosophers say, P, not only do we believe that P, we can use a sentence like P and we can understand that sentence, meaning we can understand how it is someone would behave if they believed something like P. We can understand the conditions under which it's true. We can understand what those conditions require of anyone acting in those circumstances and so on. So first thing is just by being able to voice our beliefs, by having sentences in the natural language available to identify what we believe, we can understand what we believe. Uh, what we believe. Not only that, it seems to me that having that capacity brings with it many other capacities too. So for example, if I understand a given sentence like P, maybe pick your favorite sentence. Uh, the population of Scotland is larger than the population of Wales. Why that came to me, I have no idea. But just pick an arbitrary sentence. I can understand that. But now having understood the sentence, I can ask myself, is it true? And that means I, well, I now think about the evidence, the size of Scotland, what I know about various citizens, about various cities, what I know about the industries or whatever. And on the basis of that evidence, assuming the evidence available to me, maybe at hand, maybe in memory, is persuasive, I can assent and say, well, now I actually have subject to correction, but say Scotland's population is larger than the population of Wales. Now, at that point, just by assenting, uh, by making a judgment about the proposition, which language enables me to identify as a potential content of belief, by making a judgment about it, by assenting to it, I thereby form the belief. Of course, I may have actually unconsciously had the belief previously, or maybe not, but just by saying, yes, the population of Scotland is larger than the population of Wales, and we are constructed, presumably under evolutionary pressures, uh, as language users, to be such that when we do assent to that sort of sentence, we tend in general to believe it, meaning we tend then, having settled on it, to act as if it were true, and in that sense to believe it, in that functional sense as we say to believe it. So not only does language enable us to understand the things that we believe or the things that we prefer, the things that we value, it equally enables us to, to make up our minds about them, as we say, to form beliefs. Now animals, form beliefs presumably under the ebb and flow of evidence in a more or less subpersonal or impersonal and subconscious or mechanical way. They just come and go. But we can decide, for example, to form beliefs in a certain area. 
by taking the relevant sentences, by asking ourselves about the evidence, we understand the sentences, by assenting or making a judgment, and then we find we have the belief. So we can decide to make up our minds. We can make up our minds in that sense. And the third thing this gives us then is, of course, if you ask me what do I believe, do I, do I believe that Scotland has a larger population than Wales? Well, now here's what I can do. I don't, I don't have to say, do I? And then shut my eyes and introspectively scan whatever that might be, you know, my state's mind to see, can I spot a belief, you know, of that kind in my head, as it were? I don't have to do that. In fact, few of us can do that in any case. Um, but what I can do is, I, you ask me, do I believe that? All I say is, OK, is the population of Scotland larger than that of Wales? I think about it, I say, to, I say yes, it is. And now, at that point, you know what I believe. And I can tell you what I believe just by simply saying it is larger than the population of Wales, because I have what used to be called in the 17th century maker's knowledge of my states of mind. You ask me about my state of mind, do I believe this? I know what I believe, and I can convey to you what I believe just by making up my mind, by using the sentence, taking evidence, assenting to it, and relying on it to actually um, be something that I do uh, believe. Not only that, but I can, um, I can actually uh, take responsibility now for what I believe. Because you ask me what I believe in a situation where you're clearly going to rely on what I say and answer, you're going to adjust your behavior to me, and so you don't just want me to report on what I believe as a, an anthropologist might, so that if I get myself wrong, I say, gee, I mustn't have believed that, I got myself wrong. No, now I can convey to you in a way that induces and merits reliance on your part what I believe by, say, being really careful about the evidence, and then by being careful that I maintain the state that the evidence leads me to, so I can actually take responsibility. I can say to you, you can depend on it, I believe that. Even with something like, is the gambler's fallacy a fallacy? And, well, perhaps I'm a poor gambler and lose a lot of money as a result of accepting the fallacy in the casino, but somebody takes me aside, I think about the evidence, I do the calculation, and I say, yes, it's a fallacy, right? thereby forming the belief. Of course, being careful about that, I know that's correct. Let's suppose I have a good idea. But I can also regulate myself, not just in the formation of the belief, but in acting up to it. I know, for example, when I go to the casino, perhaps, that I'm liable to get distracted. And I can't just resist putting on all my money. There's been a run of blacks on the, on the red. But I can bring a friend with me you know, to stop me if I'm going to do this sort of thing. So in that way, I can regulate what I believe, and I can assure you then and invite you to depend on the fact that I do believe that um, by virtue of being able to make up my mind and convey it to you on the basis of maker's knowledge and take a maker's sort of care about doing it. Of course, not only with the case of belief, I can ask you to depend on my believing that, but it's always a possibility that I'll change my mind. So the sort of reliance I can invite is in that sense only partial reliance. But I can go even one better with action. I can say, I will do that, where I discount not just the excuse that, oh, I changed my mind, but even the excuse, the excuse that I uh, got myself wrong. Um, you see, I discount that in telling you about my belief on the basis of maker's knowledge. I can't say later, if I don't act as if the belief is true, oh, I must have got myself wrong, precisely because I communicated it in the making of that attitude, in making up my mind. And with the promise I can go one better, I deny myself the excuse not only that I got myself wrong, but also the excuse that I changed my mind. Because when you promise, you give yourself a reason to maintain the action that you promise, which you can't quite do with a belief. All of this, as conversable agents, we, as I say, not only understand what we believe, we can make up our minds about what we believe, we can convey what we believe to others, and we can invite others to rely on us taking responsibility, as in, you can blame me if I turn out not to act up to that belief, and in particular, if I turn out not act, to act up to that promise. Now, the question is, can corporate agents be conversable agents? That's really the crucial issue as to whether or not they can be given rights or make use of rights. 
And briefly, I think the answer is yes. And in order to invite you to see why I think this answer is plausible, let me ask you to suppose that we have an arrangement. And those of you who read Hobbes will remember the arrangement I have in mind. Suppose that we have an arrangement as a group that some one individual, or perhaps a number of different individuals on different topics, that they will, as we say, speak for us as a group. That they are entitled to say what it is we value, what it is we desire, what our plans are, what our uh, positions are in various things, what our policies are, what indeed we'll do, we as a group, in a particular case. Suppose that we've selected individuals to speak for us uh, in a coordinated way, of course, they'd better be careful about coordinating what they say on our behalf, else we'll end up with being committed to behaving in an inconsistent manner. But suppose we have such spokespersons, and suppose that we agree amongst ourselves that we will individually behave as the words of the spokesperson require of us that we behave. If that's, going, if that's the case, then what's going to happen is that the spokespersons can do for us as a group what I as a conversable agent can do for myself as an individual. I can tell you what I believe. I can convey what I believe. I can take responsibility for what I believe. I can ask you to rely on it. And above all, I can ask you to rely on what I will do, precisely because of the sort of conversable agent I am. An animal can't do that. But now by analogy with the individual, the group which sets up, say, a single spokesperson, or as I say, a collection of spokespersons who are coordinated with one another, who are entitled by their authority to speak for the group, to speak for what the group holds on a given issue, to speak for what it prefers, to speak for what it values, to speak for what its policies or its plans are. And if we, as members of the group, are really committed with one another, to follow those words, to live up to them, then those spokespersons speaking for us as a group make us into precisely conversable agents. We become, as a group, an agent that can do exactly what I was saying an individual can do. Uh, we become, as a group, an agent that can speak for itself, an agent that can say what it believes, an agent that can make promises, uh, make avowals as to what it uh, values and so on. And at that point, we as a group become an agent that can be guided by rules in just the way individuals can be guided by rules. Because now we can understand rules, we can subscribe to them by taking the formulation of the rule and by, by our spokesperson, our spokespersons, making up our mind on the rule, saying yes to it, and by actually taking care that as a group we do live up to those words by having an appropriate organization or whatever amongst ourselves. And we can thereby uh, not just subscribe to the rules, but take responsibility for abiding by the rules. And insofar as that's the case, we as a group can enjoy the rights operating in relation to other agents, maybe other group agents or other individual agents. We can enjoy the rights that the rules give us. It can be a matter of common awareness amongst the agents in question, corporate and individual, that everyone, corporate body and individual body, actually understands these rules, subscribes to these rules, and takes responsibility for these rules. The take responsibility is important in my view, and I've written about that independently, that a group agent is capable of being held responsible and is able to take responsibility for something uh, because of uh, precisely being organized so that it can give its word as to what it will do, and it can be organized in such a way that having given its word, having endorsed that, having made that judgment as to what it will do or what it ought to do, uh, it then has control as a group insofar as it's appropriately organized and people really do go along with the words of the spokespersons. It can be held responsible. It has control for acting up to those words over itself and so can be held responsible when it doesn't, and can invite being held responsible uh, for, for the case where, where it doesn't. So this, at one level, establishes, at least I hope, that corporate agents on the face of it, there's absolutely no reason why they shouldn't be thought to be capable of bearing rights, because that just means capable of operating under rules that give them rights in the way I've described. Um, and the, the sort of theory I've, I've just um, the sort of remarks I've just made 
are actually quite familiar from uh, older periods. So, for example, uh, you find it in medieval writers in the 14th century already. Um, you find people talking about representation as the means whereby groups become, well, they use the word legal persons, they, uh, the word persona. So, for example, in 1354, I happen to have uh, rifled this out, Albericus de Roschiate, um, I'm sure you household name, after all. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he speaks of a collegium, or a, a, a group agent, if you like, as being, although it's constituted out of many members, it is one by virtue of representation. And of course, that becomes a very famous theme, for example, in political philosophy with, Sa with uh, Bartolus of Sassiferato and, and Baldus de Obaldis. Uh, they argue very strongly that we should think of cities as, for example, when it's organized democratically as a corporate body that is, as one of them put it, Bartolus, a princeps sibi, a prince unto itself, because it operates as, a, uh, as an agent with plans, etc., and it lays down rules for itself, these people operating corporately. And in explaining that, he says that the council, which is the spokesperson body, so to speak, the spokesbody of the city, uh, Baldus, our, Baldus actually says the, the council represents the mind of the populace. Concilium representat mentum populi. The idea of a corporate agent came into existence precisely via noticing the rule of spokespersons and the, the role of spokespersons and what they could do for a group in making a group behave like a conversable single agent. But of course the theme gains particular emphasis in Hobbes. Uh, when Hobbes argues precisely, he says, a multitude of men are made one person when they are by one man are one person personated. Or personation means represented. He says it's the unity of the representer, not the unity of the represented, that makes the person one. Exactly the sort of theme I've been talking about. Fortunately, one difficult issue before I leave this issue of the, the, this first section on the role of rights, which is the following. You might say, well, look, all of that's fine. But that's just to say that corporate agents can be treated as if they were agents, and they can be treated as if they had rights. But really, it's only the individuals who are the agents. And really, the only bearers of rights are the individuals within those corporate entities. And at this point, I'm going to very briefly try to summarize the line of thought that is set out at greater length in the book with Christian List on group agency. The question is, you might say that on the theory of group agency so far, we've said that individuals can become group agents uh, capable of bearing rights and indeed having responsibilities insofar as they incorporate for conversability. They establish an organization and relations and commitments to one another that makes them as a group conversable, either by a single spokesperson or a number of different spokespersons, maybe to take a, a commercial analogy, maybe on some issues like marketing or publicity or production um, or in internal organization, you get different uh, groups who are different individuals who are the spokespersons for the group, maybe under the veto power of a board of some kind. That would be one way in which you could have many personators. But they incorporate for conversability. But the question is, do they form an agent that is truly distinct from the member agents who, who make them up? And the argument, to sum it up in a way we don't in the book, the argument that List and I make is really the following, that in order to be conversable, and that falls out of what I've said so far, a group has to meet various rationality conditions. I think this is straightforward, like consistency. For example, if we as a group uh, say one thing today and another thing tomorrow, and when you challenge us with this, we say, well, that was yesterday, this is today. You know, we're a group, we're not an individual. I mean, you know immediately you can't do business with a group like that. The cost of doing business, the cost of being conversable, which is an entity that can do business, is that you've got to meet a minimal constraint like being consistent in the things you hold. So that if someone points out an inconsistency, you don't say, oh, well, that's it. No, you sort of say, OK, well, we've got to straighten that out, or you know, uh, we've got to give up. What, you, you admit the inconsistency, and you seek to change it, as you might as an individual. And now what the, the argument that we developed in that book and in earlier work is basically this. 
that the cost of being conversable as a group is that as a group, you've got to be an agent who is distinct as an agent from the individuals. Okay, let me try now very briefly to make that, uh, make some sense of that remark. When would a group not be a distinct agent from the individuals who make it up? Well, I think a straightforward answer might say, when so I think everything it does can be regarded as really just something that all the individuals do together on that issue. So that when they say, as a group, we believe such and such, that's really just a function of what the members believe. When they say we value, it's just a function of what the members value. When they say we'll promise such and such an action, that's just a function of what the individuals intend in general within the group to follow. So that the corporate form would be basically just a mask behind which you're dealing with individuals. And it's only they who are agents, and it's only they, ultimately, who have rights. One way in which, so to speak, a group might be just in that sense a reflection of the individuals who make it up and not really a group in itself, is if the group made up its mind on every issue, say, by majority voting. Then, so to speak, when you're talking about what the group thinks, believes, etc., that's a useful shorthand, maybe. But really, you're talking about an entity that's just a reflection or a shadow, a projection of the individuals involved. After all, what it does is just what a majority of them do. What it thinks is just what a majority, it doesn't think, it's just what a majority of them think. And I first got interested in this topic when I noticed, basically drawing on work, on earlier work on a slightly different topic by Lewis Kornhauser and Larry Sager, who would be known to the certainly the lawyers in the audience, uh, that actually if a group did make up its mind by majority voting on issues connected with one another, it would be very likely to end up holding inconsistent things. Uh, the argument is just then being that, well, a group certainly can't be a majoritarian reflection of its members. I call that problem the discursive dilemma. And if you'd like to look at the matrix at the back of the, at the end of the handout, you'll see uh, what I had in mind. Suppose you've got a group of three, A, B, and C, as I call them here, and they've got to make up their minds on three propositions. Proposition P, the proposition Q, the proposition P and Q. If you like, think of A, B, and C as the members of a departmental committee, uh, sorry if this is close to the bone, that is looking at a hiring decision or a promotion decision. And let's suppose that uh, the person is going to be hired or promoted just in case they're judged to be excellent in teaching and excellent in research. Let P be excellent in teaching and Q be excellent in research. Now, on the issue of P, whether this person is excellent in uh, research, member A votes yes, member B votes yes, member C votes no, but that means that the group vote yes on majority voting. Okay, then on the issue of is the person excellent in research? Well, on this issue, member A votes no, B and C vote yes, so the group by majority voting, vote yes. Terrific. It sounds like, well, the group's going to appoint the person, right? Because he's judged by the group to be both excellent in teaching and excellent in research. But now look what happens if you use majority voting on that uh, third question of whether both are through. That's the P and Q. Member A is going to say no because he said no to Q or she said no to Q. Member B is going to say yes because of saying yes to both of the others. Member C is going to say no to Q, P and Q because of saying no to to a P, and so two are going to say no, and you're going to have no on the part of the group to the question whether the person should be hired. So you'd have the group saying, excellent in teaching, excellent in research, accepting the rule that they should be appointed if excellent in both, but saying, no, they're not excellent in both. Now that shows you that this group, which is trying to be faithful to its members, trying to be just a reflection of its members, so to speak, thrown up a precipitate, so to speak, of the members, it can't be that and yet be conversable. Now, in order to become conversable, to be, which at its minimum requires being consistent, what this group is going to have to do is change its mind on one of those propositions. Uh, perhaps it changes its mind on P and Q and decides that the person should be hired. But then notice what it's doing is it's, as a group, endorsing the person is excellent at both and therefore should be hired, even though a majority of members think otherwise, think the opposite. So what you can see here is the pressure, so to speak, of rationality on the group. If it's going to be conversable, not look like a fool entity, so to speak, reporting back, say, to the university or the department, it's got to get its act together. 
it's got to be, in order to be conversible, it's got to be consistent. But that means, in this case, it's got to not be a reflection of its members. Now, Christian and I, after, um, in 2002, published a more general um, impossibility result that showed this isn't just a feature of majority voting, it's a feature of any system of voting, any system of determining what a group thinks or believes or holds or plans or has as a policy. It's a feature of any system that tries to draw the group view out of the individual views by a mechanical algorithm like majority voting that it can never guarantee to be conversible. And since we published that result in 2002, I think there are at least seven, or there are more than that actually, seven or eight other theorems in the literature. A literature, I confess, that I don't follow and if I tried would probably not even be able to understand. It's gone quite technical. Um, I mean, I couldn't have done the 2002 article without Christian, in any case, who has technical expertise. But what those theorems are showing is that there is a real tension between the demand on a group that it be conversible and the demand, as it were, that it should be answerable to attitude by attitude to its individual members. And the upshot, I would say, of those theorems is that those are in deep tension and that the cost of a group becoming conversible being able to speak for itself, being able to operate under rules, and therefore deserve to be given rights, is that actually it's got to be committed to forming attitudes in, in a way that means it's not just a reflection of the members who make it up. In fact, um, there's going to be no systematic relation uh, between the, um, the, the views of the group and the views of the members. No systematic relation can be guaranteed if the group is to be reliably or robustly um, um, conversible. This is to say that the group, therefore, is not the same agent as the individuals who make it up, or any function of the individuals who make it up, like a majoritarian function. We individuate agents, after all, by the things they believe, by the things they prefer, by the things they desire and value, etc., and by the the procedures or rules or processes, probably unknown to them, that they follow in revising their beliefs in the light of new evidence or in the light of, of, um, of new understanding or whatever. And the thing is that these results show that a group agent, if it's to be robustly, reliably conversible, has got to be forming its beliefs and got to be so disposed to reform its beliefs in the light of new evidence, etc., that you cannot project from the views of the individual members to what the group will hold or think or do or commit to. And in that sense, it means the group is strictly not the same agent as its members and not the same agent as any mechanical function from its members, so to speak. This isn't mysterious, although I think it's quite exciting. I mean, in the tradition of law, as many of you will know, there are sort of various uh, theories of group agency, one of which is a, a, view, a fictional view that they don't really exist. It's like a metaphor. Um, this really supports what used to be called a real entity theory of group agents. As agents, uh, groups, if they're being conversable, have really got to be distinct agents from their members. However, there's nothing mysterious about it, because consistently with being the same, a different, a distinct agent, from their members. They can be the same collection of individuals as their members. Uh, they can be the same qua members of the group and yet not be the same agent. Example, uh, the Indian parliament in the late 40s, if I remember correctly, would meet as the parliament of India in the morning and in the afternoon, although body for body they were identical, they would meet as the constitutional convention. They were different agents with different commitments, with different tasks, with different rules for updating their views in the light of new evidence, but they were exactly the same body of people. It wasn't as if something new popped into existence, you know, when those individuals became the parliament or became the congress. They're the same body of individuals, but they are distinct agents. And in the same way, any group agent is a distinct agent from its members by this argument, but certainly not a distinct body of individuals. If this is all right, then it suggests that there should be no hesitation about thinking that corporate agents can operate under rules the way individual agents can. 
they're conversable in the way required, they can understand the rules, they can subscribe to them, they can be held responsible to them, and they can take responsibility for, for conforming to them. Uh, so rights can serve them, therefore, in the same role that they serve individuals. But the two other questions are, what's the basis on which we should now determine the rights that these corporate agents get? And what's the basis, indeed, on which we should determine the rights that individual agents get? That's to say, get in legal and social practice, to go back to the theme I mentioned at the very beginning. And there are two pure, as it were, rival theories. One is individualism, or humanism, as you might call it, which says the rights to be ascribed in law and social practice to all agents, individual agents and corporate agents, should be determined solely by the welfare or the good of individual agents, hence normative individualism. So when you look to the interests of individual agents in determining the rights of individual agents and of corporate agents. The other view is a sort of, I call it, agentialism, which says that, look, what should rather be the case is that in determining the rights that go to all agents, you should consider all agents. What is special about individual human agents, so to speak, this line will say. Uh, now, I want to briefly put to you the case for being an individualist, a normative individualist, rather than a normative agentialist on this question. That's to say, thinking that it's the interests of individuals that should determine what the rights to be given to corporate agents should be. So here's, here's my first the argument. I'm going to give an argument, then a counter, and then a rejoinder, which I think is the killer rejoinder in favor of normative individualism. So the argument is this. Corporate rights, I mean the rights given to a corporate body, they're always grounded in the rights that individuals have to associate. Because after all, you only get a corporate body forming, materializing, coming into existence, insofar as you get individuals who are associating with one another in setting up such a body. So the first line is simply to say that if we give rights to a corporate agent of various kinds, that's really at bottom grounded in the fact we give rights to the individuals to make up that body to associate in such a way that the group they form, the entity they form, will have those corporate rights. So the more basic thing are the rights of association we give to the individual agents involved. And then the second premise says, well look, when we're thinking about the rights of association that we ought to give individual human beings, as they always will be at base, uh, then, of course, we should be only thinking about the good of individual human beings. Not just, of course, the good of the individual human beings associating, but the good of all the individual human beings involved, say, all of those in the community. And if we're thinking about the good of individuals and treating individuals, as I assume, as equals, then we should only give rights of association, and therefore only corporate rights, insofar as, as we think, it's for the good of individuals as a whole taking them as worthy of equal concern. And that's just to say that, therefore, corporate rights should be given, rights should be given to corporate agents, only on the basis of a concern for whether or not doing so is for the good of individuals as a whole, considering them as equals. And that's normative individualism, or normative humanism, if you like. But now the counter to that is pretty straightforward. It says, wait a moment, that's all wrong. Because when you're thinking about the rights that these associating individuals should have, you should also think about what rights ought to be possessed by the agents they will bring into existence as a result of their association. Think of an analogy, the, 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 the person holding this line will say. Think of the analogy with children. Uh, individuals have the right to procreate. Uh, fine, but we don't think for a moment that in determining the rights that the procreated agents will have, we should only look to the good of the procreating agents. Of course, we say uh, people should have such and such rights to procreate, but they, the rights, the, the good, so to speak, uh, that determines how the procreated agents will be treated, what rights they will be given, are not, is not just the good of the procreating agents, but also the good of the children. So that, for example, we wouldn't for a moment allow people to procreate in order to produce a child who will serve as a slave for them in future life, because that's not taking account of the good of the produced agent as well as the producer agent, and we think that we ought to take account of that 
um, ex ante, so to speak, even before they come into existence. So some might say, this is a crazy argument. You're saying we should only look to the good of the associating agents and not worry about the good of the agents produced as a result of the association. Now the rejoinder to that, which I think of as the clincher rejoinder, is that, um, well, first, that the analogy with children is really inappropriate and doesn't carry weight. And here's the way of, of uh, bringing that, and the reason being that where children become quite independent agents, now independent in a different sense from the sense I spoke of earlier, quite independent agents from their, uh, from their parents. So for example, they're not the same anything as their parents, whereas the collective agents, corporate agents, are the same bodies of individuals as their agents. Um, whereas in that, in that sense, children are independent of their procreators. Of course, corporate agents are not independent of those who associate in order to create them. They continue to rely on those people in order to keep them in existence, for example. And now, on the basis of that disanalogy, let me put the clincher consideration. If we were required in determining um, the rights of corporations to take account not just of the good of the individuals associating, but also the good of those corporate entities, uh, then we'd have to proscribe practices that seem utterly acceptable, unobjectionable which is, suppose a number of individuals decide to get together and associate and form, for example, a partnership rather than a company. Or a partnership does not have the same corporate rights as a company has. For example, it doesn't enjoy limited liability under most jurisdictions in the way in which a company has. Uh, it would be crazy to think that no individuals shouldn't be allowed to do that because that's not taking account of the good of the entity they create, the partnership. If we took account of its good, we should say that they shouldn't be allowed just form partnerships. They should go the full hog and form companies with limited liability. Or again, think of, I mean, the history of commercial incorporation over the last 200 years. Uh, it began with incorporation being allowed, but only for a certain period, not indefinitely. Um, it also involved uh, something less than limited liability. It involved uh, permission to associate and form a corporation, but only under an act of parliament. Um, it involved uh, corporations being able to be formed, but only to uh, exercise activity in a given sphere, not to change spheres of activity. It involved corporations being formed, but not being able to own other corporations. You'd have to say that, gosh, when we did that, well, as we still do in many cases, we're actually not looking after the good of corporations, which we should be doing by the counter to my original argument. And that seems downright daft. So by a sort of reductio ad, absurdity, ad absurdum, if you go with the counter, you're going to have to take that line. No one can take that line sensibly, it seems to me. And so I come back to the thought that in determining what rights that group agents or corporate agents should have, while recognizing that they're distinct agents from the individuals who make them up, still we should only be concerned with the good of individuals in the society as a whole, not with the good of those corporate agents considered as something distinct. I think that same consideration argues against, for example, thinking, well, individual agents are more important, but corporate agents are important too, so we should have a weakened form of the agentialist view giving a certain weighting to the good of corporations and a heavier weighting to the good of individuals, I think the same sort of argument will work against that particular line. Uh, you might say, well, we could have the following view. We could say that we look after the good of individuals, um, but if we have two situations in which you, the good of individuals is equally satisfied, uh, but in this situation, corporations would enjoy greater good than they do in this situation. Even though individuals enjoy the same good in both, then by a sort of lexical ordering, we should prefer the one that gives greater, that looks after the good of corporations. I wouldn't have any objection to that. I just think it's probably unlikely ever to apply because the uh, people are deeply invested, of course, in the groups and corporations or corporate entities that they form. And so it's very unlikely that individuals could be equally happy, equally looked after, so to speak, under two regimes where one involves corporate entities being looked after better than the other does. I just simply think that's unlikely to arise as a possibility. 
So that takes me to the final section. So just to get the picture clear, I want to say that corporate agents really are distinct agents from their members or any function from their members. They are, re are real entities. Uh, they're capable, therefore, of in operating under rules and be held re responsible under those rules and enjoying rights under those rules. But secondly, I've argued that when it comes to determining what the rights that these group agents or corporate entities should have, we should look to the good of individuals only, and not separately or independently or additionally to the good of those corporate agents themselves. That's the normative individualism. So now the first section argues against a sort of individualism in arguing for real entity theory that really are these group agents, whereas the second in the normative area argues for an individualism. We should only look after the good of individuals. But the final question, of course, is if we do take that individualistic uh, basis of reference, um, what actual rights should we be assigning to individuals and to corporate entities? This is really the crunch question, isn't it? I'm going to weasel, I should say in advance, because I, I, <laughs> I'm going to uh, maybe lay out a pattern or a schema for thinking about the issue, but I, unfortunately not, I'm not going to give you a, a uh, 10 principles you know, which will de determine the rights of of corporate entities or anything of the kind. So when it comes to determining, um, we've agreed on individualism, normative individualism, but when it comes to determining what rights individuals should have, of course, different political philosophies will take you in somewhat different directions. Well, some will take you in radically different directions. Um, I'm going to think, uh, I think about this quite naturally in terms of the sort of Republican political philosophy uh, that uh, Martha mentioned. Um, under which, um, as I and many others, including many in this audience, think of the tradition which prioritizes a certain sense of, of freedom, a robust notion of freedom, under which you're required, at least in the basic choices, the basic liberties, I'm not going to say very much more about those, but I think of those as the choices in a society which follow, satisfy the following condition, that they're capable of being enjoyed by everybody at the same time, uh, so that they're not in that sense, competitive. Um, they're rights such that everyone can exercise them consistently with others exercising them. And they're rights such that when others exercise them, it doesn't take from the satisfaction that your own exercise of the right uh, gives you. Um, traditionally, obviously, there are liberties like the liberty associated with speech or association or location of movement or occupation or religion or indeed ownership. I mean, as in the liberty under the local conventions of property of um, uh, whatever they, those conventions give you, of trading or gifting or keeping uh, whatever it might be or treating it in a certain way. Now, the Republican view, as I interpret it, and this, of course, is itself controversial as an interpretation, uh, is that um, you get a good theory of justice and a good theory of democracy out of the following thought that we should organize our societies so that people enjoy free, those freedoms, those basic liberties, with an appropriate sort of security. Um, that means that in those liberties, they each have a privileged right, of course, of exercising those liberties, and others being prevented from, um, ideally, by social norms and laws, from interfering in their exercise of those liberties, they will need claim rights, obviously, against the community, perhaps, for the resources that will often be required for developing the capacities to be able to exercise those liberties, or for even having the resources sometimes needed for exercising those liberties. So welfare rights, for example, are going to be part of the package. Uh, and they will need claim rights equally against the community to protection, for example, from others, but equally to empowerment in relations that of asymmetrical kind, maybe in the workplace, maybe in the home, uh, that would actually make their freedoms not robust, meaning that they have to depend on the permission of others for being able to exercise those freedoms. And this sort of view would also suggest that it's not going to be enough to have rules that empower people and protect people in that way against one another. You also have to have rules that give a certain protection against the very community that imposes those rules on them. 
So people are going to have to have immunity rights, I would say, against certain forms of legislation by the community as a whole or by whoever is in government. And equally, are going to have, have to have certain contestatory rights, meaning rights of challenging what the community is doing, whether in elections collectively, but equally individually on the various channels of, of contestation available. Anyhow, that's going to give you a picture of, as any comparable philosophy, for example, the sort of philosophy that Martha Nussbaum is a strong defender of, the capabilities and functioning approach, it's going to give you a view as to what rights individuals should have against one another and against their government. And that's relatively straightforward. We can see how rich, in principle, I think those rights are likely to be under that sort of philosophy. But now the question is, what rights should we give to corporate entities if you take a philosophy like that? Now I'm thinking, as I say, in Republican terms and using that, but you can plug in your favorite philosophy at this point, because it's not really going to be terribly relevant which particular philosophy you take. And I take it on the basis of the normative individualism defended in the second section of the talk that we should give rights to these corporate bodies and give the corresponding rights of association to individuals, of course, only insofar as doing so answers to the good of individuals in Republican terms to the robust freedom as non-domination in the sphere of basic choices that individuals can enjoy treating those individuals as equals. So we only give such rights as are consistent with and indeed promote the good of individuals considered as equals, however that good is, is understood, as I say in my terms, in, in a Republican way. And that, of course, in a phrase, is to say we should only give rights to these corporate group bodies and the corresponding rights of association that are fair to individuals taken as a whole within the community. And that now leads me to my schema. I think there are four sorts of unfairness in particular that we should try to avoid in establishing the rights that groups or corporate entities have. And these um, are the product of two distinctions. Um, on the one hand, we can think about the um, unfairness that you can get in a group that's private to the group. Uh, in other words, the, sorry, the unfairness that you can get insofar as Individuals have more power than others. Some agents, like corporate agents, have more power than others. That can create unfairness in Republican, or whatever your preferred terms are, across those individuals. But equally, you can have public unfairness, where, whereby the individuals who are in charge of what the rules should be, that they have an unfair advantage over those for whom the rules are laid down. That's going to be political unfairness, or vertical unfairness, where the other is a sort of horizontal unfairness, the private unfairness. And each of those forms of unfairness can arise in a narrow domain of the group itself, what we allow, how we allow the group operate internally, and equally in the wider society as to what powers we give the group in that wider society. Now, in order just to illustrate, and this is just the scheme, as I say, for thinking about what rights group agents ought to have, let me look just very briefly at those four categories of unfairness and taking commercial corporations as examples indicate what strike me on the face of it as forms of unfairness that, for example, a Republican approach would rule out, thereby limiting the corporate rights that would uh, generate those unfairnesses. Uh, but as I say, I think many other uh, philosophies would, would support a similar, a similar line. Can I take about three or four more minutes? I think I'm just getting close to the hour. Um, OK, so the first form of unfairness, number one, is the private unfairness that you can have in a narrow domain. In other words, the unfairness between the relations of individuals within a group agent. Of course, commercial corporations are not the worst example of the sorts of unfairness you can get here. For example, the religious sect, you know, or the ethnic group in which some individuals carry much greater weight than others can be a source of great unfairness in this way. And I think that groups should not be allowed the right to organize themselves in a way in which it creates such unfairness. But looking at the commercial corporation, on the face of it, it strikes me that, well, there are, this is probably a red rag now to various people, so let me just confess in advance. I mean, it strikes me the basis of managerial and uh, regular worker remuneration in commercial corporations as we have them now is pretty well obviously unfair. I mean, given that we've distinguished and learned this thing between the owners of a corporation, the stockholders, and the 
controllers or the managers and the workers, well, we know now within most existing corporations, uh, the workers' rates are determined almost always by um, you know, a pretty tough market game, as in what the competition is, what's the least, the hardest bargain you can drive as an employer with the employee to keep him or keep her in, um, in, um, in employment. But when it comes to the top managers and how they're remunerated, as we know in many cases, remuneration is determined by auditing firms and, and other bodies, which actually are often indebted to the very managers whose, or top managers, whose salaries they will dictate. Now that seems to me as a straightforward case of private unfairness as between the members in this narrow group of this same entity, a commercial corporation. Or another case is the case of uh, the basis on which people can be fired. I mean, it's quite difficult to fire a top manager or manager at any level above a certain uh, perhaps medium level uh, without various compensation forms, without going through various procedures. With, uh, um, whereas on the other hand, with many regular workers, uh, we have basically a right to fire at will without having to go through any procedure, without having even to uh, give a ground either in the interest of the corporation, of the stockholders, as to why this particular individual should be let go. Now that right to fire at will, which, uh, uh, which corporations have in relation to some workers but not in relation to others, that creates an internal unfairness on the face of it. It just seems to me an ABC of ethics, uh, that that's something that we should really seriously question. Looking at the second category, um, I think that there's a, a, an unfairness in commercial corporations nowadays. Again, they're not the worst offenders by any means. Various churches, various sorts of associations are much worse in this respect. But even within our commercial corporations, the top managers have a, a in virtue of their political role, have got a clout and uh, possibilities available to them, opportunities uh, that are really quite unfair in comparison with even their shareholders, for example. Um, so we know that in most uh, commercial corporations, uh, the way boards are organized, it's extremely difficult to hold individual um, top managers responsible um, because um, of the voting at the annual general meeting, the proxy system, the fact that very few people turn up because they're invested in a small way in so many different firms, and the boards very often are in any case very close to the top managers, so don't exercise a great deal of uh, surveillance. Now everybody says, but of course, the stock market will do that job for you because if someone isn't running a firm well, uh, the price of the stock is going to go down and that's going to put a real accountability constraint on the top managers. However, there are all sorts of activities in which top managers have largesse, so to speak, have got a carte blanche to do as they wish. One is, for example, to give donations to political parties under Citizens United because it's not as if those donations are examined in any serious way by the members as a whole uh, so that the top managers have a great degree of discretion uh, and of course can purchase presumably favors and position and relationships and promises down the road for themselves by being the dispersers of the largesse of these group agents. Now that seems to me to create on the face of it a great unfairness of the second kind. Um, this has actually been registered in many ways by the Supreme Court in past judgments, as in the Austin case, if I remember, in the, uh, in the early 90s, where they argued very strongly about the difference between a body that's constituted in order to support a political cause, where members, so to speak, know why they're signing up and hold to account those who act for them in furthering that political cause, and an entity like a commercial corporation which is founded for quite different reasons and which when given the right of political donation, for example, political support, that right is actually exercised only by a few and under little accountability to others within the group, indeed even to the shareholders. Finally, the other three, two categories, number three and four, corporations have enormous, it seems to me, uh, rights that grant, generate great private unfairness in the wider domain of society. So take, for example, uh, just the position of corporations in the courts vis-a-vis -vis individuals. And think of the advantages of corporations, uh, the economic advantages, the very deep press that many corporations have, the legal advantages. So for example, a case that's currently before, about to come again before the Supreme Court 
involves the, uh, the alien torts law. And uh, if the decision goes the way a previous court has taken it, for example, corporations could not be held responsible under that tort law, though individuals can be held responsible. That's just a very small example of ways in which corporations have legal advantages by comparison with individuals. Or in relation to tax law, think of the cases in England where it turns out because corporations can multi-locate and claim the location where the tax is payable as the location where the taxes are at the lowest and so on they can get wonderful legal privileges that are unavailable to, to individuals. Or finally, and perhaps most important of all, economic groups, uh, commercial groups, and indeed group agents of any kind, have a huge psychological advantage because they don't suffer anxiety. They go on living, for example. And this comes up, we know, with compensation cases, for example, in the uh, case of the uh, Exxon uh, Valdez, many of these people died before compensation was actually made available to them, whereas the company goes on, well, in principle, under our law, can go on forever. So it doesn't have the pressure, so to speak, of, of worrying about old age. Uh, equally, it doesn't have the pressure, of course, of anxiety, sleepless nights, and so on, because different individuals act for the corporation. And finally, of course, there's one very strong feature, which is that people acting on behalf of a corporation do not have to feel the shame they would feel if they were acting on their own behalf in taking a very hard line. In Irish history, which of course I was raised uh, to savor and sup on, uh, it was widely always held, and I think correctly, that the, uh, the landlord's agents were much worse than the landlords, because the agent could evict anyone and say, well, you can't blame me, I'm just, I have to look after the interests of my landlord. Agency, in that sense of distance from the center, can give you great shamelessness, and I think that corporate entities are not subject to the normal restraints of shame, um, at least in certain one-to-one -one legal contexts that individual agents are. This makes for, I think, a real danger in our social and political lives if we don't re recognize the reality of corporate agents and the fact of, you know, they're like titans in our midst. And if you go with the economic, it seems to me, idiocy of saying that, well, they're not real agents at all, they're just you know, contracts between individuals and there's nothing but individuals around, you really miss that fact. Now, they're real agents. That's the theme of the first section. They should be given rights, but, gee, their rights should really be limited so far as possible. I haven't looked at how far that is possible in order to compensate for this, on the face of it, possible unfairness in private relations with other individuals in the society at large. And that takes me finally to the last topic, which is the power that corporations invariably have politically in the wider domain, in any society, partly because they're usually sources of employment. And anyone in government is going to really worry about the corporation moving offshore or moving out of the district. And that immediately creates a huge pressure on politicians to take the interests of these corporations into account and to second guess them indeed. The corporations don't even often have to do anything. Of course, that, it seems to me, is, is compounded. That particular uh, possible unfairness is compounded when you allow corporations political donations, as, as we do now, um, in, at least to a certain extent, in the light of Citizens United. Um, it's often said that freedom of speech is, given that money is speech in politics, requires that we give corporations these rights. That seems to me just like finish on this theme. I'm sorry for having gone on so long. That seems to me utter rubbish. There's a big difference between freedom of speech and the opportunity for speech. So for example, um, to take a line from Herbert Hart, he used to argue, uh, take a group like this or a parliament or an assembly of any kind, eat, everyone can have freedom of speech, but if, so to speak, everyone speaks at the same time, and no one derives any benefit from that speech. So you have to ration the speech. You have to have a system of rationing, which gives everyone a chance. And we do that under Robert's Rules of Order, for example. In the wider society, our rationing system has been, up to now, uh, at least in this society, not in all, has been one under which uh, basically you get the rostrum, so to speak, in the society, the media, insofar as you're able to pay for the media. That's OK to the extent to which the capacity to pay is fairly evenly spread. But once you make the capacity to pay extremely lopsided by bringing in 
corporate agents with equal rights with individuals, then you can undermine that rationing system. And to say that freedom of speech requires, it seems to me, just simply to fail to see the difference between freedom of speech and the opportunity for speech. Anyhow, that's at, least, at least I've come close to the ground with those last remarks. I hope this hasn't been too, too abstract and so on. I probably have tried to take too much material into account. But the picture I offer you, I trust, has some appeal, which is that indeed there are group and corporate agents distinct from their individual members. Uh, in that sense, these are real entities. Although, of course, no mystery, no, as it were, romantic German mystery there. It's not that they're anything over and above the individuals. They're the same collection of people as individuals, but they're different agents from the individuals who make them up. Uh, when it comes to the rights they should have, I think it's clear that we should consider only the good of individuals, not the good of these entities. And I think there's a real research program in thinking out properly, as we should be doing in political and moral philosophy, what those rights are that we ought to be giving uh, to those corporate entities and what those rights are that we ought to be denying to those corporate entities. Now, these few poor remarks of mine in conclusion um, offer nothing really very concrete, I'm sorry to say, or substantive. But I do hope that it points at least to a research program that badly, badly needs to be further taken by other hands, I trust. Thank you. That was really terrific. So thank you very much. We now have time for some questions before the reception. Brian. Um, <coughs> Philip, I want to ask you about the connection between the conversability conditions and rights. Because I'm, I'm a little unclear about this on your view. You, you said at one point that conversability conditions make one capable of bearing rights. But I wasn't quite sure why you thought that, right? So the I'm arguments sorry. seem to go, right, that for there to be legal rights, there have to be rules and rule following. For there to be rules and rule following, you have to have some creatures that satisfy conversability conditions. But it doesn't seem like any particular bearer of rights has to satisfy conversability conditions. So for example, non-human animals could have claims rights as long as there are people around to satisfy the conversability conditions and can apply the rules. So I'd like to hear more about that. I, I absolutely agree with you on that. I, I'm sorry, I just left out some remarks that I should have entered at that point, which are in the, uh, in the written version. Um, I, I'm focusing here on rights that bear on choice. And I'm focusing on rights in the rich sense in which to have a right, you've got to be able to affirm the right. You've got to be able to waive the right. It's a right in that more restricted sense of right I have in mind, rather than right in the sense in which, of course, uh, we can give rights to uh, children, for example, where they're not in a position to affirm the rights themselves, not in a position to waive the rights, and even, of course, to non-human animals too. So there is an extended sense of right that, of course, can be bordered by non-conversable agents. I was just simply focusing on the sorts of rights. And when I talked about the practice-based um, rights, I was thinking about these agents as agents who set up these practices, who follow these rules, and who have a symmetrical relationship to one another under those rules. Now, those sorts of agents all have to be conversable in relation to one another and in themselves. But of course, they individually or they as a whole might give rights to entities who are not themselves a part of that active rule setting, rule changing, rights establishing community, for example, to their children or to non human animals or indeed to the environment for that matter in various ways. Yeah. 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 So at the risk of uh, being daft, uh, I want to see um, see if the agentialist can can say something uh, in response. Um, and in particular, I, I'm I'm curious I'm curious about premise one, right? So you've got this claim that corporate rights are grounded in individual rights of association, and it seems true that uh, the right to associate is a necessary condition. Right, for um, us to get together in a sort of way that will um, allow us to form a, a corporation or a group um, that's itself an agent. But it's not clear to me that uh, our right to associate is really what grounds um, the rights that, that a group or a corporation um, 
might have in a, in a normative sense, right? I mean, so why not explain it um, in terms of conversibility? Um, and then it seems like it's true that it's a, it's a necessary condition on there being this agent that individuals have um, rights to associate, but that's not what grounds the um, group rights, it's, it's just the facts about conversibility. Um, and so that seems like a reason for at least wondering about the truth of one and the argument for individuals. I was using grounded in rather a hand-waving sense, not in the contemporary philosophical sense of a strengthened form of supervenience. Um, I, I meant simply that in order to give a corporate entity rights, as you put it, it's a necessary condition that you give individuals um, certain rights of association. But it's also actually a sufficient condition in the sense that just giving a corporation rights is giving, is giving individuals rights to associate in a certain way. So for example, giving a corporation the right of limited liability is simply giving the individuals the right to associate in such a way, putting their monies into a common fund, that only that fund is answerable for the debts that they in that association, for example, uh, build up. So I think maybe the grounded in was an unfortunate phrase because it suggested you know, some sort of normative linkage. Um, it was simply, simply to make the points I, I've, I've just said and then to put as a, a more or less persuasive argument that, well, look, we're looking at individuals. Maybe there are no, so, no corporate entities in, 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 in existence at all. And from this point of view, there are only individuals around. We want to determine their rights to associate. That's what we're concerned with when we ask about what rights groups will have. They're the only ones around. We ask about their rights to associate. And then the thought is, well, shouldn't we only just consider their goods and, of course, the good of other individuals as well um, in determining what rights of association they will have? To which, of course, the counter is, as I give it here, that shouldn't we look forward as well to the groups they create and consider ex ante the rights of those groups, to which my counter then is that's to think of them as children when actually they're not. And that comes out in the fact that when you, if you really did that, then you'd have to proscribe possibilities of association that create entities that are just about group entities, but group entities with very limited rights. For example, the partnership rather than the company. Yeah. Let me see if I can just follow that up in the following way, because I find this argument that groups are in some sense agential based on these conditions of reversibility, um, but not reducible to their members. Um, does seem to raise a question I think that the previous question was perhaps getting at. So for Kant, what makes us human is our capacity to set ends. That's what actually distinguishes us from animals. And that in a way our capacity is to set ends. That's what he talks about in the metaphysics of morals. To be an agent, to be an end setter. And that's what sets us off from animals, and that's what actually makes us beings with dignity that cannot be used as a mere means. And what I find very interesting about where your argument goes is it certainly looks as if the rather minimal conditions that you're setting down here for agency of the corporation turn corporations or groups of other kinds into end sets. Um, and then on Kant's terms, they actually have the same, or so it might seem, dignity as individuals. And so might, for Kantians, you might be leading Kantians down a path um, towards endorsing um, corporate rights that few Kantians I know would want, want, want to pursue. But that might then suggest that, perhaps quite interestingly, that really what we care about with agents is not just those conversibility conditions, but some of the other things that you talked about at the end, the capacity for reactive emotions, the capacity for um, something like a ro more robust conception of the human good than a corporate group which can merely focus on its own rather narrow notion of interest could have. And so it may be that what, you're, what, what I would like you to push, to push you to suggest is that you, know, you start out by noting the rather minimal notion of agency that you're working with and raising the question as to whether those conditions right off the bat actually have much 
sort of pick out a being with a lot of value. Um, and this would perhaps push against some context of being. Yeah, no, I, 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 that's very, very nice. But, so I offer that to you. No, I, I indeed. Um, the people who have challenged me most, and that's part of me to think more about group rights than we did in the book, Christian and I, are precisely Kantians, you know, who were sort of pulled two ways. I mean, if persuaded that group, ag group agents are really agents, and actually it's not all that minimal, because after all, it's agents in a much richer sense than that in which animals are agents, at least by my view. Uh, it's a sense in which there are agents who are conversable, you know, can make up their own minds, can make promises, can commit. Um, then I found Kantians pulled in two directions. One is, but that can't be right because we don't want, they're not ends in themselves, right? But on the other hand, you, well, okay, I see the point. Well, maybe we should start thinking about them as ends in themselves. Uh, I've, on the whole, welcomed their bewilderment. <laughs> not being a Kantian, <laughs> it seems to me to point in exactly the direction you are indicating, that we have to take into account more than just the requirements of conversable agency, let's call it, in order to determine properly our ethical um, duties and, and, uh, and aims. Uh, and indeed, it's on that front that individual human beings are very different indeed from, uh, from group agents. Um, I mean, it's, it's very, one very interesting thing is it's not just Kantianism, but suppose you're a utilitarian who's a preference utilitarian, right? So you think that it's just the satisfaction of preferences. Well, by my account, and you know, I really think this is, is unassailable, uh, groups do have preferences. Corporations form preferences all the time. So if you're concerned with preferences and you think that it's not reducible to the preference of individuals and you're a preference utilitarian, then you ought to treat groups as equally important with individuals, at least to the extent to which they're centers of preference. So that's also going to be a problem. I mean, that sort of utilitarianism is also going to have a problem with the reality of group agents. Now, where this goes is another question. I mean, I'm trying to you know, say where, as a Republican in political theory, I would go on this issue. And I don't find myself a tension. Yeah, can I join in at this yeah. point, just uh, in following up on Dan, what Dan said? You didn't talk about the body. And obviously, yeah. one huge difference sure, exactly. in, between corporations and individuals is yeah. that corporations, if they had, can be said to have a body at all, it's this yeah. weird sense where you did say at the end that they, they're not going to die, they're not going to get old, yeah. and so on. And we might well think that in political life, a lot of the yeah rights that individuals have are rooted in the fact that we do have bodies that are vulnerable in certain ways yes. and that need government Absolutely. to protect them in certain ways. So, so I think that difference needs to be, be more played up in some way. Yeah, no, I, I'm entirely on, on board with that thought, yeah. The thought that this more robust notion of a, of a being might be a real human being with other things besides conversibility yeah. might be thought to have, if you like, a right to have rights and that corporations do not. Corporations maybe are capable of rights and virtue, the conditions that you specified. But then your point would be they don't have a right to them, and therefore it has to do with the various notions of what our social interests are that determine which, which rights we specify. Okay, now that goes back to the point I was making at the beginning, the difference between institutional rights and moral rights. So you need a moral theory to tell you what rights individuals should have in the institutional sense. Um, I like the language of good. I'm a consequentialist, ultimately. Um, probably one of the very few in the room. It seems to be very un un unwelcome. <laughs> well, I know, yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> we, we, we stand together. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean the law, the law school world, yes. Yeah, right. OK, yes, I suppose that's right, yes. But there is the economist. That's the good, the, the bright side of the law and economics is that, the dark side. <laughs> so. So when you said a right to have rights, so you might have as your theory, your moral theory might be not a good center theory, but a moral right or natural right center theory. And you might simply say that it's only human agents who have moral rights, and that it's the moral rights of individual human agents that should determine both the legal rights that individual human agents have, but also the legal rights that corporate agents should have. Okay, I think so. because we have a reception waiting, uh, we should take maybe uh, at most uh, two two more questions. Okay, Courtney. Oh, sorry. Um, 
I have a question about the compressibility condition. Um, so it, it seems to me that um, to qualify for these certain rights, both as an individual person and as, as kind of this group, you need to meet certain levels of conversability, as you've been arguing. Is it the same standard for both individual people to qualify for these rights as well as for um, groups to qualify for these rights under the law? I mean, it seems to, my intuition, not having thought about it a lot, is that it seems like we might want to hold these groups to kind of a higher standard of kind of dynamic consistency than we might an individual person. Um, in part because a person has a body, we can kind of identify them over the time. We think that people do have these moments where they lock out of rationality, but we wouldn't want to use that as a condition for denying them some of these rights, whereas kind of a corporate entity we would want to hold to a higher standard because without it, we don't really have kind of this agent that we can deal with. I think that's a very good point. Uh, well, first of all, corporate entities often have much greater powers and they're much more of a danger to, so to speak, individuals than other individuals are to individuals. And so for that very reason, there may be a ground for special caution uh, in dealing with, uh, with corporations. So let me take one example, uh, although it's not, well, I suppose it's related to rights indirectly. Um, we don't, um, strict liability seems to me perfectly reasonable in many cases with corporate agents. Um, that's a very high standard after all in the sense that uh, it requires, it puts a lot of pressure on the agent to take a lot of trouble over avoiding, uh, over precautions and so on about, against a certain sort of activity. Now corporations are, um, first of all, they're quite dangerous in some areas. I mean, like a food producer and so on, it can be quite dangerous for the population as a whole. And imposing strict liability in a case where you mightn't impose strict liability on an individual might seem perfectly appropriate in virtue of the greater danger and also in virtue of the fact that a corporation has the resources and the means of establishing you know, internal uh, surveillance type systems to guard against that danger. Uh, to serve as precautions against that danger that an individual or a smaller group might not be able to do in the same way. So I'm, I'm certainly very sympathetic to the idea that we should in that sense have higher standards in determining, and that I haven't addressed at all in the talk. Uh, we're not have the last word. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about um, at when the, the traction, when you get to the concrete examples of the commercial corporation, because I think you, you made it a little bit easy on yourself because of the differential treatment and the inconsistency, for instance, um, with uh, 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 dismissal at will or with the, the way compensation is uh, attributed to different individuals. So, but for instance, um, if you take the example of dismissal at will and you think perhaps that maybe boards can also dismiss managers at will, right? And I think that recently happened at Citibank or something like that, right? Um, so if there isn't the inconsistency, right, what does the argument sound like in terms of the equal good of individuals? Doesn't it then just, doesn't it boil down then to a political economic argument and a very kind of, yeah, I mean, aren't we out of the realm of, um, I don't know, aren't we out of the realm of the, the expertise of the rules here and simply at more of a kind of political economic level? Yeah. So for example, on the, uh, the difference that I was seeing is that with the, when the board dismisses a manager, there's almost always written into the contract a big compensation package that they've got to pay to the manager in the case of dismissal, where there usually isn't or often isn't in the case of the regular worker. That was the sort of asymmetry that I was focused on. But I do agree that if the concern that determines what rights firms should have in that way, uh, in terms of their internal organization, um, is the good of individuals as a whole where they're taken as equals, then certain empirical conditions might actually argue in favor of a right to dismissal at will, even though, say in Republican terms, it's as such very deplorable because it creates an asymmetry of power. You'd, 
creates a dependency on the person who can fire, uh, in the person who can be fired, and so on. Uh, but you still might think that that ill, in Republican terms, is more than compensated for if, for example, having a right to fire at will means that there's a much higher level of employment in the society, which is a standard argument, after all. Um, a standard but not very persuasive argument, it seems to me, in most cases where I've seen it work. But if it really were the case, if you could be shown the case that if you've got vast unemployment, you've got real suffering, say, in Republican terms, if you introduce a right to fire at will, you lift the level of employment and you really compensate in that respect, even though you create another ill, but still an ill that's compensated for, more than compensated for, by the good created, then I would say in that case, I'm a consequentialist after all, I would say in that case that argues for, you know, I'm reluctant to admit it, but in those conditions that would argue for a restriction on the right to fire at will. Uh, sorry, a, a allowing a right to fire at will. Okay, well and now we'll, we won't stop talking. We'll adjourn to the reception outside where you'll have plenty of time to talk to Professor Petter, but I'd like now to thank you very warmly for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.